and uh, welcome <laughs> to those who are here on YouTube. We're sorry for the delay. We had a little hiccup with our YouTube this morning. We're glad that you're here. It's the children's time. You haven't missed much. Um, so uh, Corey is a raccoon who loves stories, and he hears the different stories of his friends, but they aren't very good stories. They're stories of um, hurting, they're stories of revenge, they're stories of fear, they're stories of, um, uh, of, of calling people names, and everybody's wondering, is there another story that we can live by? And so uh, last time, Corey met Swift the horse, and Swift has another story for them. And so they're, gonna, they're creating a little plan to go back to the town and to uh, see if they could live by a different story. We're almost there. I should have bookmarked it. <laughs> okay. So as they trotted along, it said Swift Horse shared her plan. So when they reached Old Village Square, a crowd quickly gathered because no one had ever seen a creature so large and so beautiful as Swift Horse. Let's have a special meal in honor of our special guest, Corey said. Let's set up a big round table and let's all bring our favorite food to share. But please, everyone, leave your shiny objects at home. If you remember, there's a lot of people who um, were um, be trying to find happiness in their shiny objects. While their neighbors prepared the special meal, Corey and Al rode Swift Horse out into the deep forest. They found turtle, lizard, snake, and frog and invited them home. If you remember, they were kicked out of the village because they were different. As the sun was setting, they returned to the old village riding on Swift Horse's back. They saw the big round table full of delicious food. Corey gave the furless, featherless neighbors the places of greatest honor, right next to Swift Horse. Then Corey asked everyone to take off their baggy gray coats so Swift Horse could see their beautiful, wonderful differences. If you remember, uh, Porcupine suggested they all wear these baggy coats to cover up their differences so that nobody would be kicked out of the village. As they ate their meal, Corey's neighbors told their stories, stories from their own lives and stories from the long ago days of their ancestors, stories of hope, and joy, stories of pain and sorrow. Swift Horse listened carefully to every word. After the meal, Corey turned to Swift Horse. Would you recite one of your poems for us? She nodded her head, shook her mane, looked at each guest with her big brown eyes and began to speak. Her gentle, strong voice sounded like a song. Six old stories wherever I go, the same six stories are running the show. The story of power to dominate. The story of striking back with fury and hate. The story of running to find a safe place or pointing at others to shame and disgrace. Or being stuck in self-pity for the pain we've been through. Or of me having more shiny objects than you. These same old stories steal freedom and laughter so nobody lives happily ever after. But... Swift Horse began walking around the table as she continued her poem, her hooves clip-clopping to the rhythm of her words. There's a new seventh story to live by, my friends. A new seventh story without us against them. Of working for fairness in all that we do. Of refusing to strike back when others strike you. Of facing our problems and not running to hide. Of not letting differences make us divide. Of turning our pain into compassion for others of not wanting more than our sisters and brothers. The new seventh story that I'm speaking of is the story of peace, and the hero is love. For a long, long time, there was only the sound of the wind in the trees and Swift Horse's hooves as she circled the big round table. Swift Horse stopped walking and spoke again, My friends, the most wonderful story in the universe is the story of love growing and spreading from one heart to another. We all get to play a part in this story. There is no big or small, no short or tall, no best or worst, no blessed or cursed, no dirty or clean, no cause to be mean, no rich or poor, no reason for war. 
We have more than enough in the story of love. Each is for all of us, and all are for each of us. This is the wisdom this new story teaches us. Eyes blinked and opened wide. Ears perked up, tails twitched, brows furrowed, and feathers ruffled. All around the table, faces looked surprised and curious. Smiles began to form on many faces. Swift Horse raised her head and let out a loud whinny that echoed through the streets. Nobody had ever heard about a seventh story before. It sounded beautiful and wise to nearly everyone. Hmm. Except for Badger, Fox, Weasel, and Skunk, all at once they started growling and snarling, growling and snarling. No, stop, be quiet, you're hurting our ears with your words, they shouted. Go back to where you came from. We like ruling over others by tooth and claw. We like wearing our baggy gray coats, and most of all, we like making more and more money by selling more and more shiny objects. We will never, ever, ever have enough, and we will never, ever, ever live by your silly seventh story. Go away and never come back, you big, ugly donkey. That is mean. Badger, fox, weasel, and skunk started throwing leftover food at Swift Horse, and then they threw their plates and silverware too. They snarled terrible words at her. She began walking away and then turned back, her eyes so sad, yet so full of love. In her gentle but strong voice, she said, Drive the poet away, but this story will stay. Long after I'm gone, the story lives on. Her words only made them more angry. They jumped up from the table, ran toward her, and snapped at her legs. They drove her out of the village, over the broad meadow, and to the edge of the clear stream near the deep forest, snarling and growling and snapping all the way. Nobody knows for sure what happened to Swift Horse. After that, some say they hurt her, some say they did something even worse. Whatever happened, Swift Horse has never been seen in the old village. Since that day, Badger and Fox have been getting richer and richer selling shiny objects. The sky is getting smoky and the stream is getting murky because of the shiny object factory. Old Skunk still says terrible things about neighbors without fur or feathers. Many feel life is very, very unfair. But Swift Horse's seventh story is still alive in many hearts, which means that a surprise is coming. Late in the day, as the sun is setting, you can find more and more animals walking out of the old village to the stream to talk with Cory and Owl about the seventh story. Fox even joins them sometimes. They leave their shiny objects home. They take off their baggy gray coats and let their beautiful differences show. They recite Swift Horse's poem, and they all bring food and share a meal. They build a glowing fire and sit in the circle around it. After a while, Cory knows it's time to speak. Swift Horse was right, Cory says. The old stories separate the old village into us and them, us ruling over them, us overthrowing them, us getting away from them, us bullying and rejecting them, us feeling sorry for ourselves because of them, or us having more shiny objects than them. But this is the truth, Corey says. There is no them. We are all part of one great, big, beautiful, wonderful us. We can all choose to be part of a healing story, the story of love. This story can set us free. This story can lead to a happy ending for everyone. Who, who, who will choose the seventh story of love, Al asks. Then Corey looks each person in the eye, just as Swift Horse did, so full of love, and asks three simple questions. Which stories are you living by lately? How are they working out for you? How can we live by the seventh story together? They sit around the fire and talk late into the night. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody didn't like the end of that story. 
Yeah, well, you know, sometimes the happy endings are the ones that we have to work towards. Um, I, I love this story. I love stories just in general. But um, who, who, who gets read a story at night? Who, did anybody? Or who was read stories at night as a kid? Yeah, yeah. Um, stories have the power to shape us. And what we hear in this story is there is uh, stories that can shape us in ways that are unloving and stories that can shape us into ways that are loving and caring for other people. And so we need to tell those kinds of stories. And that's kind of what we do here on Sunday mornings as we come together and we tell those stories of Jesus, stories that can shape us into the people who are loving and caring about our neighbors. And so if I, there is one thing that I would encourage you to do is to read those stories. Read those stories with your kids, read those stories with your grandkids, read those stories for yourself, and let those stories shape you into who God wants you to be. We're going to sing a little song. It's a favorite one from my childhood that we would sing often. Tell me the stories of Jesus. I forgot to put the little dash mark so Rick knows there was the last, uh, last verse. Uh, kids, I'd invite you to uh, you know, go down to uh, Sunday school with Mel and Amy while well, Rick plays one more round of that. No. <laughs> <laughs>
Our first scripture this morning is taken from the book of Leviticus, a book which not many of us have read. I was curious when I read this, and so I looked it up, and I read the preamble, and as I've done in Con and Mount Forest a few times, I've signed a bit of homework. Go home and read the chapter. There's a lot happening before this passage that we will read this morning. Anyway, Leviticus 16, verses 20 to 22. And when he had finished anointing the holy place and the tent of the meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both hands of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the Israelites and all their transgressions, all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and sending it away into the wilderness by means of someone designated for the task. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a barren region, and the goat shall be set free in the wilderness. And then reading from John 11, 45 to 53, and this passage is preceded directly by the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Do you not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed? He did this not to say this on his own, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, not only for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, some odd scripture readings this morning. Um, uh, I think you have the rest of my sermon. (laughs) So so you can give it back, or uh, or we can have a really short service. Well, I, I know you wouldn't want to miss this one, because this is the, the last installation in my sermon series, Windows on the Cross. And uh, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the different metaphors that are used to answer one of the most important questions of our faith, why did Jesus die? And each metaphor that we've looked at is, is like a window allowing us to uh, view the cross. But as is the nature of windows, they only give us one perspective, not the whole thing. So the purpose of this series um, has not been to suggest that one of these windows is better than the other, but that, in fact, we need to look through all the windows in order to have a deeper understanding of the cross and how it saves us. Uh, So far, we've looked at three windows. I'll just catch you up. We've looked at the payment window, the victory window, and the magnet window. Today, we look through one last window, which is maybe less a window and more a mirror, and we call it the mirror metaphor. The mirror metaphor of the cross is a modern interpretation And it's by far the newest of all the windows that we have looked at so far. And it began with the work of this man, René Girard, a world-renowned anthropologist. And uh, it began with his theory of mimetic rivalry. And now you're asking me, what's mimetic rivalry? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) The theory of mimetic rivalry explains the cause 
of human conflict. And it goes a little like this. All of our desires in life are learned desires. We watch what others desire, and like a mime, mimetic, like a mime, we copy and desire the same things that others do. But what happens when two people desire the same thing? Rivalry, mimetic rivalry. And we've witnessed this all, especially if you have kids, right? You have two kids, and one's playing with a ball, and even though there's a gazillion other toys in the room, what toy does that other kid want? The ball the other kid has. And so then what do you get? Kicking, screaming, hair pulling, name calling, conflict. But that doesn't just happen with kids. It can happen with adults. It gets played out over and over again, but with worse consequences. So you can imagine, as an anthropologist, uh, Gerard studying early, the earliest human communities, and that if left unchecked, mimetic rivalry had the potential to escalate violence to the point where the community, that fledgling community, would be destroyed. And so, how was it that these early tribal communities were able to overcome this propensity towards violence? Well, Gerard theorized that it all had to do with religion, myth, and sacrifice. The thing that tribal communities found with mimetic rivalry is that killing someone in the violence was an effective way of dissipating the tension caused by mimetic rivalry. And it had this unifying effect on the community when somebody was killed. And so, Whenever tension started to rise in these tribal communities, the solution was to sacrifice someone. Someone on whom all the problems of the community, whether it was food or uh, um, war or drought or whatever, someone whom they could blame the problems on. And then religions, so um, Gerard um, theorized that religions were then formed around these killings and the sacrificial practices that were sort of universal across many different uh, human societies. These sacrificial practices were then couched in myth. That's where we get some of the great myths of uh, ancient religion. And the myths, though, he would say, were there to mask the truth, which was that these weren't sacrifices made to appease a god, but in fact, mob violence. Gerard believed that behind the sacrificial deaths of the ancient myths, there was always an innocent victim of mimetic rivalry. And that keen insight that he had into religion, myth, and sacrifice made him famous as an anthropologist, but something happened, though, when he started to apply his theories to Christianity, and specifically to Jesus' death. He described what he found in the Bible as bad myth, meaning that unlike the other ancient myths, the Bible did a terrible job of covering up the, uh, the blood of innocent victims. And uh, just, the, even just think of the first murder in the Bible, Cain and Abel. Cain kills innocent Abel. Why does he kill him? The Bible is very clear. He was jealous of his brother, and so he killed him. There's no covering up. There's no, um, uh, no excuses made for Cain. It's just there. And you could also consider what we read this morning from Leviticus about uh, that, that ritual practice of um, the goat. And it's interesting that it's just out there in the open about what they're doing. The practice was you were putting the sins of the people onto an innocent animal, 
and then sending it out into the wilderness to generally die. That practice is where we get the term scapegoat. And you know what a scapegoat is? A scapegoat is a term for an innocent victim who bears the blame of others. And so it's this kind of candidness about violence, innocent victims, and sacrifice that continues throughout Scripture, culminating in the death of Jesus on the cross, where we most clearly see the consequences of mimetic rivalry and the violent ways we deal with conflict. And so we're going to take a closer look at what Gerard found as he peered through this unique window on the cross. So in a nutshell, this metaphor says Jesus' death on the cross is not a payment of a debt we owe. It's not a ransom given to free us from Satan's power. It's not an example of sacrificial love to draw us to God. That's the other models we've looked at. But rather, Jesus' death in this metaphor exposes the violent mechanisms society uses to restore peace and unity. Author Tony Jones uh, uses the metaphor of a mirror, and this is what he writes. He says, in the crucifixion, God is holding up a mirror. We look at Jesus on the cross, and we see our own systems of violence and scapegoating reflected back at us. And so, who is God in this metaphor? Well, first, God is a God who does not require sacrifice. That's quite different from some of the other metaphors. God may have put up with animal sacrifice for a time, but ultimately, God does not need bloodshed to be appeased. Rather, God abhors violence and the killing of innocents. God is in solidarity with those whom society vilifies and victimizes and puts up on the cross. In this model, God cares for the scapegoats. So then what are humans like? Well, humans are plagued with mimetic rivalry, where we desire what others have. Our sin is the sin of selfishness. We are covetous, greedy, jealous, etc., etc., to the point of violence, violence against our neighbor. But at the same time, we're also victims of that violence, victims of each other's desires. And at any moment, we could be victimizer or victim in this never-ending cycle of scapegoating violence. And that's a problem. <laughs> Mimetic rivalry threatens to destroy the relationships and the communities in which we live. But there's another larger problem to mimetic rivalry, and that is the solution. <laughs> the solution has always been scapegoating violence, and that is just as problematic. I'm going to give you an example to kind of help uh, wrap our brains around this. You may have heard that our neighbors to the south are having an election, right? <laughs> Lots of news about that. And you know what the most powerful emotion that gets people to turn out and vote? Hatred, anger, I'd say fear, but all, that's all sort of wrapped up together, right? And so every time there's an election in the States, the fear factor is turned up to 11, and you are told to be afraid of everything. And every minority that you can think of gets sacrificed on the altar of fear. Migrants are coming to take your jobs. Muslims are coming to take your life. Trans people are coming to take your bathrooms. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All of this, all of them scapegoats, the list goes on and on, all of them vilified in order to unite an us against a them. 
And that's how scapegoating works. And that's the thing. It works, right? People win elections when they make people afraid. People win when they can unite people against a common enemy, whether that is a real or a false enemy. Scapegoating violence does release the tension caused by mimetic rivalry, but here's the thing, only for a while, until the next election cycle comes back. And again and again, the cycle repeats. Just like in the story I was reading with the kids, right, where the animals live by mimetic rivalry until Skunk proposes the solution. Let's blame the neighbors here and send them away. Those are the stories that so often we live by. And that's where Jesus comes into the story. Jesus, in many ways, looks just like another victim of scapegoating violence. And here's the thing. Unlike other scapegoats, when we see Jesus on the cross, we do see an innocent victim. You know, other acts of scapegoating violence are usually covered up by blaming the victim, accusing them of something. But the Gospels make it blatantly clear that a serious injustice has been done when Jesus is killed on the cross. And that haunting image of a truly innocent victim hanging on a cross causes us to look at ourselves. It holds up that mirror to show us the role that we play in perpetuating this scapegoating violence. What Jesus' death saves us from is that blindness that we have to the ways that we participate in these cycles of scapegoating. So I'm going to give you a little illustration here of what we're talking about. Um, Gerard, incidentally, doesn't use a mirror to describe this, this metaphor. He uses the idea of a virus, a contagion. And, and, and having been through a pandemic, I think that's one we can relate to. <laughs> And so, like most viruses, often before, so if mimetic rivalry is the virus or the contagion, um, often before a cure can be developed for a virus, a vaccine is developed. And so in this sort of illustration, scapegoating violence is the vaccine to mimetic rivalry. And the vaccine works. We've seen how it works. But, like many vaccines, you're going to need a booster to get, keep that immunity up, to maintain that. And so we continue the cycles of violence. And in fact, as the contagion continues to mutate and grow, you may find you need more powerful vaccines. But no matter how many vaccines you get, the contagion never really goes away until there is a cure. And for Gerard, um, Jesus' death is the cure for our mimetic rivalry. And once cured, there's no need for more vaccinations, no need for more scapegoats. So let's have a look at what Scripture says about sacrifice. Sacrifice is a big deal in the Bible. There's lots of time spent detailing the specifics around how to make proper sacrifices to God. But there's also a strong tradition that questions the efficacy of sacrifice. When Abraham is going to sacrifice his son Isaac, God says no and provides a ram instead. King David writes in the Psalms, the sacrifice that is acceptable to God is a contrite heart. And prophets like Micah remind us that God doesn't want oil or rams or even our firstborn. Instead, God requires justice, kindness, and humility. Jesus in the New Testament also questions 
the sacrificial system, saying, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Not to mention how he, at this time of year, we hear this story of how he flipped the tables in the temple, the tables of the money changers, a financial system that was set up for the strict purpose of proper sacrifices in the temple. So a case could be made that God does not need the sacrifice of humans, animals, or Jesus, for that matter. And if Jesus' death isn't a a blood sacrifice to please God, I guess we have to ask, is there any reason why we might view his death as an innocent scapegoat? And the evidence is there. It's it's fascinating for me that in John 11, which uh, Jim read for us, this is exactly how Jesus' death is viewed, right? Um, The chief priest says, talking about the community that's under threat of being uh, destroyed, he suggests, it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. Caiaphas knows Scapegoating violence works. It is the vaccine. It's the solution that they go to. But I think it's really important to remember that this this proposal is coming not from Jesus, not from God, not from Jesus' friends. It's coming from his enemies. In other words, God isn't the one who is blessing and sanctioning Jesus' death on the cross, this scapegoating violence for some redemptive purpose. It is those in power and the mob that supports them. The only problem is that Jesus is not a good scapegoat. A good scapegoat is someone people don't see as innocent. But if there's one thing the Gospels make perfectly clear, it's that Jesus was innocent. Jesus' trial before the high priest. It says that the witnesses' stories, they couldn't keep them straight. They were false witnesses. Uh, The trial before uh, uh, Judas, the betrayer says to the chief priest, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Pilate's wife says to her husband, have nothing to do with that innocent man. Pilate tells the mob, what evil has he done? The rebel crucified next to Jesus defends him saying, this man was innocent, done nothing wrong. And a centurion after Jesus' death says, certainly this man was innocent. What makes Jesus' death different from other scapegoats is that there's no denying it. He was an innocent victim. So what is the strength of this model? Well, in many ways, I think it's a bit of a breath of fresh air. Because unlike all the other models, which in one way or another condone violence, and as such then implicate God in that violence, the strength of the mirror metaphor is that it puts the sin of violence squarely on God's, on our shoulders, not God's. In Jesus' innocent death, we see the extent of that violence reflected back to us, and we now know that God has truly condemned our practices of scapegoating. On the cross, Jesus stands in solidarity with all the victims who have been unjustly sacrificed on the altar of mimetic rivalry. Forgiveness, reconciliation, unity, peace, the things that we think scapegoating gives us, Jesus says requires no blood to be shed. And in Jesus' death, we are saved from ever having to have another victim sacrificed. The only problem is that we continue to do so. And that is the blind spot of this window. We have to ask ourselves, with all the scapegoating that continues to create countless victims in our world, did anything actually change when Jesus died upon the cross? 
If Jesus' death is just a, 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 a simply to expose scapegoating violence, how come we're still so blind to it in our world? Is Jesus just another body piled on the pile of victims? I think what seems to be missing from this metaphor, which is similar to last week's, is, is whether there's any cosmic or ontological change because of Jesus' death. And that's the, that's the, the, the challenge with this model. And it doesn't surprise me that uh, René Girard, uh, coming from an anthrop- anthropological angle, a very scientific view, has seemed to have left God on the sidelines of this window. And that's a, that's a fair critique. Except that there's something really interesting about René Girard's story. Until his work on mimetic rivalry and the study of, of religions, he was an atheist. But somewhere along his journey of study and reflection, as he uncovered the, the myths of ancient religious practices only to discover the bodies of innocent scapegoats, he also found a religion of bad myth. He found a faith that didn't hide the victims. He found a God on the side of victims. He found a God who cares for orphans and widows, a God who welcomes foreigners and outcasts, a God who cares about the plight of the poor more than animal sacrifices and religious festivals. This is the God that Gerard encountered on the cross, a God who said of scapegoating violence, no more of this. And while I, 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 like all the other windows, this window does not give us the whole sky, the whole cross, my hope is that like Gerard, we will see in the mirror the ugliness in the ways that we treat others, but also a better way to live together in harmony. No more us No more them, just a we, the children of God. Amen. I'm going to invite the choir to sing uh, a song that uh, I encountered in my studies on uh, on some of these different models of the cross. And it's by Mark Heim, or it was in in sort of uh, light of Mark Heim, a theologian. Uh, His book was called Saved from Sacrifice. And I invite you, I made sure the words would be up on the screen because I think the words are really important. Thank you, choir.
Thank you, choir. Uh, let us stand for our offering. We're going to sing a little song from, uh, based on the words from Micah. I'm um, talking about the, the real sacrifice that God wants is to uh, justice, kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. So there's uh, uh, three different lines, and so the, I'll, we'll put it up on the screen there. And so the first line goes like this. I'll get Rick to give me a key there. What? what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Try that. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Okay, so that's the first part. Um, and so uh, those who have lower voices, I invite you guys to yeah, keep singing that part while the second part comes in. So it goes like this. To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God again. To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. And don't worry about the third part. I've got some people in the choir who are going to sing the third part. So let's. Uh, so we'll sing uh, two times. Just what does the Lord require? And then we'll add to seek justice two times, and then we'll add the third part. Let us uh, sing together. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of Second part. To seek justice. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Let us pray. God, you've asked us to seek justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with you. And so here we are in this place, seeking to be kind through our gifts, to do justice through these gifts, and to walk humbly with you and our neighbors through these gifts. We ask that you receive them, use them to bless this world. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let us continue in the spirit of prayer. Steadfast God, many, amid many changes and challenges around us, we are grateful that you are with us. You understand our fears. You support and guide us. You give us courage to face whatever lies ahead. Thank you for the gift of faith, a solid rock to support us. And so we trust that you keep working in ways seen and unseen for goodness to prevail. We pray silently. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Loving God, in this time when there is much to be anxious about, we pray for the world you love. Send your healing spirit to bring peace with justice to, into the troubled places. Bring care and comfort to those who have been hurt in conflict. Wisdom to those who seek to end hostilities. And courage to those who advocate for the most vulnerable. We lift our silent prayers.
God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Send your healing spirit to mend relationships between religious groups and cultural groups who find themselves in tension and turmoil. We pray for mutual respect to grow between people who look at each other with suspicion and among people who have painful histories with each other. Open our hearts and minds to those whose situations and concerns we don't understand and bring your gift of reconciliation to us all. We lift our silent prayers. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Send your healing spirit to people we know and to the earth you love. We remember before you our friends in grief. We remember those suffering illness and all waiting for treatment. To those facing difficulty at work or at finding work, disagreements in our church or community, concerns about the environment that we depend on. God, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. We pray for the continuing ministry of the church in our neighborhoods and all around the world. As we move towards our celebration of Christ's resurrection, send your healing spirit to raise our hearts and our hopes with the promise of new life in Christ. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us all with a willing spirit. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, who listens to us, we lift now in the silence of our own hearts the concerns that we have. We lift to you the prayers that are represented in the prayer bowl. Receive them. Answer them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. All these prayers, Lord, we offer up to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. I invite you to stand. May the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said together, Amen. Let's sing our closing uh, song throughout these Lenten days and nights. Uh, we'll sing it through once together, and then we'll, we'll split in half. I'll, I'll, I'll lead this side, and Rick will lead that side.
through my feet.